everybody and welcome to Wednesday's session um, for, to celebrate International Nurses Day which is the 12th of May. Um, so thank you very much um, for joining us. It's so so wonderful that you've been able to take time out to join us so we really appreciate it. Just to note that we are recording this session um, so um, we just want to make sure that um, we, this is available really for those staff that are they're currently busily looking after our patients and families and carers, so uh, we've got a record. So we'll move on to the next slide, please, Anita. This is just a bit of um, session et etiquette. As we said, if we can keep microphones on mute um, so that you can hear our speakers clearly, do use the hand up um, if, uh, option if you want to say something. What what we've decided to do is let the speakers speak and then we'll have some time at the end hopefully for some questions and answers and I'll keep my eye on the chat box um, and, and we'll come back to some questions as well. Um, and if the connection isn't great, I know we've had a couple of people say try turning your camera off um, because that, that's, that really helps. So thank you Anita. Next slide please. So today um, I'm just going to do a, a very brief introduction and then we're going to meet um, one of our Cavell Star Award winners. Um, I don't think uh, Baljinder can join us, so Bavika Pancholi is going to be dialing in. I think, Asha, you're going to dial her in at five past two. We've got a little video to show, so fingers crossed uh, the technical bit works. We're going to show the little video. And then Bavika is just going to speak a little bit about what that meant. Then Asha, you're going to be talking. Your session is looking back to our future. And um, then we've got Zoe Harris, who's going to talk about digital pathways for the management of cardio respiratory conditions and COVID. And then last but not least, Jaya Babudis is going to talk about aims accreditation and winning an excellence award. So thanks, Anita. If we go to the next slide. So the 12th of May, um, the, the little Florence Nightingale book is actually my little ladybird book. So I'm showing my age now um, and, and if, if uh, with great fondness, I had quite a few of the ladybird book series and, and one was uh, definitely Florence Nightingale um, as, as a, a hero of mine. Before I introduce Pavika, I just wanted to, to mention about Edith Cavell as well. And we talk about pioneers and we have Mary Seacole as well. Um, but I thought not everybody might know about Edith. I was really lucky three years ago, I went to the Westminster Abbey celebration, which was fantastic. And I did apply for tickets for the organisation for last year, but then obviously COVID hit. And they talked about e Edith Cabell at the, at the celebration. So Edith was the same age as me when she died, sadly, she was 49. Um, she, was, she was born um, in Norfolk and she was a British nurse serving in Brussels and she was celebrated for saving the lives of over 200 soldiers and she nursed without discrimination and helped people from German soldiers, allied troops. Sadly she was arrested and she was tried treason and um, she was executed um, by a German firing squad but the night before she said I must have no hatred or bitterness towards anybody. So she's a, re a real hero of mine and uh, the, the Cavell Star Awards are on, is a national award programme and it's given to nurses, midwives, nursing associates and healthcare support workers and you can be nominated by patients, colleagues. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping Asha, if we move to the next slide please. I'm hoping she's here. I, I have can introduce Bavika Ancholi. Are you here, Bavika? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. That's fabulous. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Would you like us to show the video first and then and then get you to just say a few words? Is that OK? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Anita, you all right to show the video? Fingers crossed. Thank you. 
you want to go to the next slide? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Over to you, Bavika. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a, a very proud moment to be here and speak to everyone. Um, so I've been a, 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 a registered general nurse for almost uh, 17, 18 years now. I've been a public health nurse for nine years. Um, obviously, with this job, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of hurdles we have to go through. Um, but I received this nomination from my manager yet last year, uh, Asha Day, uh, through this very difficult times we've all been through. And uh, I'd like you to sh show you my medal. I don't know whether you can see this. Can you see it? Not, no. not quite. No. Yeah. But um, I was so humbled and I was so honoured to receive this uh, award. Um, and um, I, I think uh, Asha felt that we, the, the, what we were all that were nominated. We all did a very hard work through this difficult time. We were uh, team members. We supported our juniors, member, member of staff. Um, and um, it was a difficult time we went through and we went through lots of hurdles and lots of challenges and uh, very honoured to receive this award. Thank you. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. I know you've stepped out of a, of a, a meeting. Um, yeah. So be before you go, I know we're doing questions at the end, but I just wanted to check if anybody, and we've got lots of uh, applause and congratulations in the, in the comments. Has anybody got any questions? I was going to, oh, go on, Asha, thank yeah. you. You ask yours and then I'll ask mine. Well, I'm just going to say, um, do you get you do you get a pin badge as well? I know you were trying to yes. show us. Show us yes, the, uh, I do. I get a, a, a quite a nice size medal and also a pin badge as well to put on my uniform. Fantastic. Yeah. But if you could just put the medal against your body so we can see it and put it further up, further up because we can't we can see the top of the box a little That's bit higher. It. Brilliant. <laughs> it's disappeared now completely. Thank you. Bavika, I just it's a comment really rather than a question. And there were five members of the team that were awarded these. And it was because I'd never seen a public health nurse, a health visitor, or a school nurse receive these. And it was done in the evening, late on a Friday night, in, in batches. But what I really wanted to say, and what Bavika hasn't said is, at the time that COVID hit, and all that time, and she'll know this, that mm. that particular team were down to 32% of establishment, yeah. and they still hit their KPIs, they set get going. And, and every time I said, I really don't want to ask you this, but you know, this needs doing, yes, Asha will do it. And I was so proud of you guys. Um, yeah, just so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asha. Thank you for nominating. It's really important, isn't it, to remember that, you know, we, to celebrate each other, to say thank you and, and, and then to receive an award um, must have been a really proud, proud moment for you. So congratulations to, to you and your fellow team members and thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for coming and sharing today. We really appreciate you taking the time out. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And just to say, if you go onto the website, you can nominate colleagues. So you can nominate. So let's get nominating. Right. Thanks, Anita. So without further ado, can I now introduce my new colleague, <laughs> Asha Day, who is currently working as international recruitment matron. So thanks, Asha. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and now you're going to put that that slide up. I, I did. I put it up. Yeah, and I, I feel like quite embarrassed, really, because um, you can see all the things that I do, and some of them are in work, and some of them out work. So you can ask me questions later. So let's get rid of that. <laughs> and what I wanted to talk to you about was, you know, looking back to our future. Um, so just take the slides down a, a minute, um, Anita, that'd be great. Thank you. So I want to talk about looking back to our future. You know, we, we go through and if you've been in nursing as long as I have, uh, somebody says, oh, you know, when God had a dog, 
um, you'll know that we go in cycles, don't we? We reinvent the wheel and it's got new spokes on and we use new terminology, etc. So that's really what I wanted to, to step on. And on Monday session, we heard a lot of nurses saying, well, I started off as an SEN. Yeah, that's me. I started off as an SEN because I was told with three um, science A levels that I, I wasn't going to be a very good SRN because Indian nurses don't make good SRN. So pulled up my socks and thought, I'm going to get there. So yeah, so years later, I became a health visitor on top of that managed an R&D department, a clinical governance department, and then came to Leicester in 1999 to, to look at be your head of EDI and then left back two years later to work for the Department of Health anyway. Full storyline, I became a clinician back in Leicester Partnership Trust as a, as a health visitor and, and now currently I'm the international lead for nursing recruitment. Again, back to our future, what happened in the, in the 40s, 50s and 60s, Windrush? So nursing and recruitment internationally is not a new thing. Mary Seacole was not a new thing. So we're looking at it and we're looking at it a different way because what we've now got is memorandums of understanding, government to government organisations looking at actually where we can ethically recruit nurses from. So I remember I was day three into the role and somebody said to me, and it wasn't Emma, can we have your project plan day three? And I'm thinking, I've been asked at week three, but not at day three. I said, I can do one. So off Asha does, and she does the spreadsheet, because I love the spreadsheets. This is the activity, this is where it's got to be done by, this is the task group. And Emma says, that's great, but can you turn it into a Word document so we can understand it? So that's the process we are at the moment. So nurses are adaptable. We have many, many skills. So we're not just in the business of nursing, as we'd call it. We have all these other skills that we normally say, oh, well, I don't think well, I'm good at that. But actually, you've probably got 80% of the skills to do those other, other bits. So what we do know with the NHSEI have said, we have 50,000 vacancies that we have to fill by 2024. There is no way with the uplifting the nursing candidates or recruits that we've got from our home countries, we're ever going to make that. So we need to shore that up by our international recruits. So let's have a look at where we can get them from. But it has to sit within the ethical arrangements that the World Health Organization do. So we have an understanding that we cannot recruit from now 47 countries. It used to be 153, it's now 47. And guess what? The country that we recruited from mostly is the Philippines. And we were asked to take a step back from the Philippine government because of COVID, because they can't afford to lose their nurses. And what happened? Start of week three into this role, and I'm sitting there with Emma and I'm saying, Emma, I don't, I don't, I don't feel very comfortable because the second largest cohort is from India. Look at what's happening in India. How can we ethically recruit from India? So off goes a phone call um, to the region, to the national team. And on Thursday, uh, on, on Tuesday, I had an emergency meeting. No, travel from India is restricted. So nobody can come in, nobody can go out. However, you can still recruit from India. I'm thinking, how's, how, don't know how that's going to work. So I just sit tight and I remember saying, to, and I remember I'm, I'm sending Andy email and Emerson, they've said this, however, just watch this space. It's a daily debate. And I know off the record, um, there was a conversation that I had at senior government with our Secretary for Health and it was decided then and Friday morning, I think 12.30, 1.30, we had an email saying we're not recruiting or we are not to pause recruiting from India now. That will have a, a, be a decision that's going to be reviewed at the end of May. So we're pausing, but that is our, our target. Now I've got really big plans for LPT um, and I shall share them. So don't record this, but you will record it. So our population in Leicester is from the north part of India, from the Gujarat, or their ancestors are from the Gujarat, from the Punjab, all that area. Now, the majority of our nurses come from the south of India, so we, we recruit from Kerala. India is a massive country, so even if you recruit from the south of India, they may look like me, they don't speak the same language, they have a different accent, their names you can see are completely different. So in the long term, if this post could become as possible or whoever takes it over, what I'm trying to do is build some um, arrangements with our government and the Indian government 
because what probably don't know in most countries, it, uh, nursing is controlled by their states. So, you know, the US, uh, they have states, India has states, and they're controlled by them. So they'd have a national board for their nursing and midwifery, they have local boards. So let's see if we can get some uh, collegiate work done with those states so we can actually get the language and the cultural reference that our groups over here in Leicestershire use. So that, that's great. So that's long term plan. The other bit of long term, and I'm talking about futures here, is about refugees. Now, the BBC announced earlier this week that Liverpool University was doing this fantastic work with refugees. And I'm thinking, oh, I remember this. Now I remember this the first time round I was a health visitor because we had interpreters who were nurses, who were therapists, who were doctors, but couldn't get job uh, jobs as clinicians because they didn't know how to do the adaptations. I'm thinking, how many people have we got in our local community who've been here for a few years we could recruit from? Because what the Liverpool model do is they recruit from the camps. So they recruit from Lebanon, um, uh, Palestine, etc., and get the medics or the nurses from over there. And then they start the process. I'm thinking, oh, let's see how much we've got at home. So th this is what I've spent my uh, few days thinking what we can do locally. However, Going back to my my background and going back to my future, I started reflecting because I'm not born in England. Um, I was born in, in northern India and came to England at a fairly young age. So what was it that I needed that I didn't get? A, I came over in October, it was blooming cold and it was wet. So I came, it was dark and I can still remember the lights at Heathrow Airport and my mother dragging me over. This is your father. I'd never met the man. I had never met my father and I was five and he was trying to speak to me in, in Punjabi and I was like, I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen because I've been brought up by my paternal grandparents. So these individuals who come, no matter which country they come from, it's a new environment. They have to have a certain level of English because that's what we what we want when they come to LPT. But the English that we speak is not necessarily the English that they learn. You've heard about the Queen's English. So in a lot of the Commonwealth countries, they learn English as the as the Queen would speak. So they're not I up me up. What's that? It's raining cats and dogs. You've literally got cats and dogs coming down. So we need to be doing that. So my uh, sort of my really lessons for you is I'm going to be working with the ward areas and we have identified those so thank you Margot and Sarah um, and every uh, heads of nursing you have identified the ward areas what we need to do is prepare the wards to receive these individuals and it's not about just the clinical skills because these girls men come with absolutely superb clinical skills they were probably heads of nursing heads of departments back in their home countries and and they've chosen to make a career choice so they've come over here so some of those clinical skills we just need to make sure and ensure so in terms of governance that they're, they're up to date but what we also need to do is make sure that their spiritual and pastoral and social care is looked after and you probably heard you know we're at work a long time and that's your work family I used to say I have work husbands and a husband at home because my work husbands were all the people that I worked with and they were mostly men at that time so we've got work family and home family but the people who are coming over that's all they're going to have they're going to have their, their, their work family and it's to be like a family so what I would like you to do is look at you know in terms of what we do as a trust and look at our values you know go back our values of valuing each other and the difference we have be kind and compassionate you know work together taking personal responsibility and be professionally curious be socially curious these individuals will say well actually I don't do this because of it adds to our learning it also adds to our patient care because we'll have patients who think uh, the same so it's about that so I will be out there in my uniform on the wards looking at that and what we will be doing is looking at a program for those staff that are receiving the nurses actually what their needs are and working out some bespoke training and it won't be oh you've got to go to an MS Teams for three hours we're trying to do it in bite-sized chunks and then video it and then 
explain it to other ward areas so we have that so no one should be frightened of we're doing that so it's based about their human beings talk to them they're probably frightened and anxious when they do come they've probably got families back home whether it be children because they will leave their children there their partners that their their parents their uncles and aunts and they might be on their own here so it's a bit more than actually come and work on our wards it's actually come and be part of our lpt family so you know as lockdown eases we will be saying actually let's have a look at the sites that you need to look at in leicestershire let's take you as a social outing to go somewhere to eat or go somewhere to the peak district so you can have a walking session so i hope you will welcome them i am around so please i'm on the global my, my no bump number is on the global so please come and talk to us and you know we're only um looking at 30 in the first year um the project is a, is a plan for the third for the first 30. There are two strands to this programme. One is grow your own and hopefully that refugees at BIC we can actually look at but also we have got um, nurses who are registered overseas who've just done their TNA nursing so they're, tra they're, they're nurse associates but unless they do that one year extra they're not going to be fully registered. However they have to do an OSCE which is they're in that academic stage of understanding what assessment planning implementation and evaluation is and that's basic nursing for us they can date their oskies they'll be ready for it and then they've saved themselves at least eight to ten months and they can be on a band five and also we did a call out for anybody who was a registered nurse working as a healthcare associate assistant etc where we can shore up their english get them through the english exam and then get them through their oskies and i'm Delighted to say that UHL are supporting us with that OSCE training. And OSCE is the, um, oh God, you're going to ask me, I think it's objective, um, objective clinical assessment process. Uh, or so. so it's done. We have a centre in Northampton that does that, but um, the UHL will take care of that. And if you haven't, they probably won't let you go in. But do you remember the old recreational building on the Glenfield site and how dilapidated? I couldn't believe it. It's the state of the art training centre. And that, I think, in the near future will be an OSCE training centre. It's absolutely superb. And they've got real life mannequins. So that's where I'm going to be trained. I'm going to cut it now because I can't see. Well, I was just going to say three, 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 three minutes. I'll show you the video. No, yeah. no, yeah. I'll, um, yeah. 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 And, yeah, and I think what I, I'm going to shut up now because I really wanted to introduce you to Sharon, who is one of our first successes at the program. Thank you. Is Sharon yeah. with us, or are we showing no video? Video. So just for context, um, Sharon is our only nurse that joined the temporary register um, and Sharon well he will tell his stories but I, I, let's show the video let's show the video thanks Anita hi all my name is Sharon Davis registered nurse waiting for my NMCP I'm working at Evington Centre Bakerley Board I have been in this profession for almost 10 years I was working as an Hi all, my name is Sharon Davis, registered nurse waiting for my NMCP. I'm working at Evington Centre, Bakerley Board. I have been in this profession for almost 10 years. I was working as an ICU staff nurse in India. Then I moved to Malta and continued my profession as a community healthcare nurse. My wife is working for UHL so that I moved from Malta to UK. It was a dream for me to work for NHS and trust me, it's not that easy. I started working in UK as a band to HCA at Evington Centre, but my dream was to become a registered nurse. As an international candidate, I had to go through language proficiency test, CBT and OSCE to get my NMC registration and my NMC pin. Thank God and thank you LPT, especially Jordan, Nirmala and Leslie for their extended support throughout the journey. It is suffice to say that without LPT's backing, I could not have achieved it. I'm extending my sincere thanks to UHL Education Team to prepare me for OSCE exam. And also, I would like to say thanks to my colleagues as well. 
not to mention the immense pressure I was in during this period, as I was the first candidate for Roski from LPD. Once again, I thank you all at LPD and wish you a happy Nessus day. Stay safe. Wow. I mean, it's such a moment in history, isn't it? The first, I remember thinking about moments in history. I remember a couple of years when we had our first trainee nursing associate celebration. And that is fantastic for sharing. That's our first Grow Our Own international nurse that's been with us working as a non-registered member of staff. And within, during COVID, he has studied and got himself through an OSCE programme with support and is now waiting for his PIN number. So it's a fantastic story. Um, we, we, we will be sharing that wider. And I know we've contacted our, our comms team. And, and thank you, Asha, for talking through the International Recruitment Programme. And particularly, I know we said on Monday when we had the nurses' prayer and poem, we think about our colleagues that are fighting the pandemic very much in India at the moment. So I will I will pause and because we want to have time for questions. And, we'll, and uh, I would like to introduce Zoe Harris. So if we can get the slides up for Zoe. Thank you very much, so, Emma. Um, OK, goodness me, that's all a bit of a hard act to follow, um, I have to say. So um, hello, um, everybody. I'm really excited um, to speak to you today on International Nurses Day. Um, my name's Zoe um, Harris, as I said, and I just thought um, just to set a little bit of context about me, because I think um, that's important and will help the understanding of kind of where I've got to today and, and the work that I've been involved with during the pandemic. So. Um, I'm a nurse who started my NHS career in 1991 and was one of the first cohort of Project 2000 nurses um, in Leicestershire. So in the end, three years later, I was a registered nurse and I also had a diploma in higher education. It was all a bit tricksy at the time. Project 2000 wasn't particularly wanted or needed. It wasn't felt. Um, so we got um, some interesting placements and feedback from, from our ends that were already working. But anyway, we got through it. So um, I've basically spent my career um, working in acute hospital trusts and the community, um, always in the um, area of cardiorespiratory um, care. So my current role is the um, clinical lead for the heart failure um, specialist nursing service the specialist respiratory team and the heart failure and respiratory rehabilitation team. So I know very much we're talking about nursing today. Um, however, I'm really proud to work as part of a, a multidisciplinary team and I'm fortunate enough to work with um, medical leadership as well because we have got integrated um, respiratory consultant that we work very closely with. OK, so I'm going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about how um, the cardiorespiratory team has used technology to support our care pathways um, during the pandemic. So um, next slide, please. OK, so we're looking at the um, digital pathways for the management of cardiorespiratory conditions and COVID-19. OK, next slide, please. OK, so there was a need um, at the beginning of the pandemic because we look after patients that have got long term conditions. So we really wanted to um, maintain our um, level of clinical support, but reduce some of the human contact. Um, we wanted patients to have access to their clinician so that if they were feeling unwell, um, they could receive timely um, support in the hope that that would reduce unplanned hospital admissions. Um, we now know that obviously um, with the media and whatnot, patients were pretty much frightened, well, frightened um, a lot. So basically hospitals in Leicestershire were actually pretty empty during the first wave of the pandemic if they didn't have COVID. Um, we wanted um, later on, I'll come on to what we did with regards to our support of um, COVID-19 patients. Um, and also from a rehabilitation point of view, we couldn't um, deliver rehab, which had always been a face to face class um, because our patients were shielding. So we had to think about um, how we could still care for them in a different way. So what I would say that we did um, as a team was that we very much um, 
uh, rapidly responded to the needs of the system. And when I say the needs of the system, that was across kind of primary care, community care and the hospital. Um, and we looked at how we could use digital technology to support people with their long term condition, which was very much um, discussed and agreed with the patient because it wouldn't be fit for um, wouldn't be fit for all patients because they might not want to use it. Um, and patients have the security that they were being cared for in their own homes, which for the most, most part, unless you're my gran, um, who quite likes being in hospital, actually people like to be at home to have their care. OK, so from a safety perspective, um, what we learned was we could deliver new pathways of care really quickly and safely with um, rapid and robust clinical governance. And that was across organisations. And one thing that I really hope that we hold on to um, as we're kind of restoring our services is how quickly we could get through the governance um, hoops, if you like, because actually things that would have taken us a year previously, we could get through in a couple of weeks. Um, and then I can give you some reflections on how um, we have evidence safety as part of that. Um, there was also um, what we have learned is that the, through what we did, there was a clear reduction in, in admissions and you'll see that in a little moment. OK, so then there's a bit of patient feedback there. Um, I feel more able to manage my condition as I've learned what's normal for me as I've recorded my data. That's a really important point and I'll come back on to that in a little while. Next slide, please. OK, so just to give you a context of the four care pathways that we put in place using digital um, to support um, in phase one, it was um, our core service of heart failure um, patients and COP COPD patients. And we did that first and that was in the spring of 2020. Um, phase two was to look at digital rehabilitation so that patients could exercise and receive education using technology in their own homes. Um, and we did that in the summer of 2020. Um, phase three was where it all got a little bit interesting because um, we started to work with um, COVID-19 patients. We um, supplied a, a virtual ward and that was supporting hospital discharges. And that was in autumn of 2020. And phase four of that was that we included patients that were on weaning doses of oxygen in the hospital um, because things were getting pretty critical by January um, and we needed to free up hospital work as a system and free up hospital beds. So we supported patients on weaning doses of oxygen. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of the setup, a patient receives a tablet or they use their own phone and they um, have clinical peripherals. So by that, I mean an oxygen saturation probe and a blood pressure cuff, um, a thermometer for patients that have got COPD. And if you've got heart failure, you will get a set of scales. Um, parameters are set up for the individual patient um, based upon their baseline. And then um, patients are asked to submit their information, so their oxygen saturations, blood pressure, etc., and um, a range of symptom based questions um, which relate to their long term condition. That's all entered into the tablet or their phone, and that comes out as a RAG rated um, status red, amber, or green. So um, when the clinician receives that, they can focus on the people who are flagging red. Um, so that on the day there is timely support um, for on the telephone or on a virtual consultation to say, actually, how are you feeling? Tell me about your symptoms in a bit more detail. And then an appropriate management plan was put in place for them. In terms of the monitoring, um, you can see that the um, individual management plan was always discussed and agreed with the patient. Um, and then as they got better, that would be reviewed in a timely way, because if we're asking somebody to submit over um, every day for five days and they're getting better, actually, you want to sort of withdraw, withdraw some of that support. Um, and I talked about how we intervene. OK, next slide, please. OK, so in terms of the impact, so we've been delivering um, these clinical pathways for over a year now, um, and I'm really pleased and proud um, as a team to say that a thousand patients have been supported across the four digital pathways. 218 actually of those um, are COVID-19 patients um, that 
um, were discharged from hospital and their care pathway basically was that they were monitored across seven day, uh, 14 days, um, seven days a week um, and with the oxygen weaning group that would be longer but the standard length of stay would be 14 days um, during that period. Of the 218 patients that we've seen um, with COVID-19, 28 of those patients were oxygen weaning. Now, the patient stories, particularly with the um, oxygen weaning group, um, just kind of, um, I don't know, uh, just make your heart, um, it's, it's just what they've been through is just, um, you, is very um, kind of difficult to articulate, I suppose. But these are patients that um, may have been to intensive care. They may have been on ECMO. They've had extended stays in hospital and they do have an extended need for, for oxygen. That's not the case in every scenario, but the 28 patients that we've supported, actually, we know that they will have stayed in hospital on average at least 11 days longer if they hadn't been supported by this scheme. That's not impo only important for those patients because they wanted to get home and reable in their own homes and get back to their loved ones. But it's really important in terms of freeing up um, ox uh, hospital beds for those people that were that were coming in. So I think that's a really important number for you to, to see. Um, 700 patients with COPD and heart failure have been supported and um, 50 patients have completed the rehabilitation programme at home so far. However, that will become part of our core service as we go on. Next slide, please. OK, so I've talked a little bit about this. Um, the readmission rate in our group of COVID patients, so the, so the usual um, hospital admission rate was um, 9%. Um, and that was, we've taken that from the COVID-19 um, wards. In our group, with support in the community, we halved the readmission rate. So again, that's really important about care being provided in the right place, as long as the patients are supported and that is safe. Um, so I think that's an important um, stat for you to see. Um, the COVID virtual ward at the moment, um, because of the um, reducing numbers going into hospital, is currently on a pause and we are um, working hard to develop a business case so that we've got something in place, um, virtual wards um, going into the autumn of this year. So that's kind of work in progress. Um, next slide, please. OK, so what did our patients say? Um, you can read some of the comments there. Um, what I would say, which is really important in terms of our um, long term condition patients, they with with using technology, um, so monitoring their own blood pressure, monitoring their oxygen saturations, they have learned actually what their baseline was and is and what's normal for them. So actually, I think um, kind of a happy side effect of using technology as an adjunct to support clinical care is that patients learn so much more about their long term condition. And that's really important because we don't look after them forever. Um, the hope is, is that we optimise them and discharge them. Um, they may come back to us, but actually, I think all of us have a bit of a moral obligation in terms of helping patients to um, learn about their condition and how they can have an impact in terms of self-management. So, um, so generally, what our patients said um, was that they really appreciated um, the help and support um, that the technology um, gave them. They still had access to their clinician. However, it was in a different way that they perceived to be safer because actually patients told us very early on they didn't necessarily want us coming round as much as they would like to see us they didn't want us coming into their home so reducing some of that face-to-face -face contact okay um next slide please okay so um there's been um uh, quite a buzz about what we've been doing and um kind of the 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 success of the the project so far um so that has um had some national interest as you can see nhsx which is the digital arm of nhs england have been really interested in what we've been doing um we've been con contributing to research um in relation to covid with um university college of london um we've submitted a um, article to the BMJ um, Innovation Journal. We're just waiting to hear as to how that's been received. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are participating now in system wide um, virtual wards um, and a board. So um, I think um, working together collaboratively 
um, in patient care in this way has kind of helped um, the cardiorespiratory team and, and build a, built a really trusted relationship um, with our with our partners um, and particularly UHL. So we are now looking at how we can have a um, virtual ward in cardiorespiratory as part of our um, kind of baseline core service. Um, so that's all um, work in progress. Um, Lizelle Bernhardt and I are doing a uh, quality improvement piece of work. So now we've got um, a thousand patients that have been through the pathways. We are looking at actually hearing from them what went well, what did they like, what can we do to support them. Um, it's really important that um, this is an adjunct to care. This is not an instead of. This is about just delivering, helping us to deliver our care in a different way. Um, and as we go forward, um, in terms of the enhancement of um, our digital pathways, patients will be in the centre of that because through doing the QI, we've got lots of patients who um, have got lots to say, are quite excited about it and really want to be part of our pathway development going forward, which is which is just ace. Um, and we are another uh, thing we're doing is um, we're involved in um, long COVID-19 rehabilitation. So again, I'm co-producing a business case to um, to provide that with UHL um, so that we can provide timely exercise and educational support to those people that are suffering with um, with long COVID. So um, Jude, um, before she retired last year, gave me a packet of seeds a packet of technology seeds I would say and I feel like I've I feel like with the team we've um at least grown a garden um so uh so, so initial idea um and and I, and I have to say this is from my perspective um been very patient and clinically led so the um, long-term condition cardiorespiratory team have um we took something off the shelf a year ago. Um, however, in terms of all the enhancements, the clinical team have been absolutely fundamental um, in how that has been developed. So I'm the lucky one that gets to talk to you. However, this is very much um, a team approach in terms of what we've done. So so I know I've rattled through that, but if you've got any questions or um, thinking about how tech can work in your pathway, um, then don't hesitate to get in touch with me after. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm very happy I'm hearing myself. Amazing, amazing um, statistics in terms of patient outcomes. But I think, you know, you captured it at the end. It's the story about developing with the team, the patients, the patient feedback. So I'm sure there will be lots of questions at, at the end. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much for uh, presenting. And I would love to now introduce our final speaker, uh, Jaya Babudis, who's a charge nurse in one of our mental health services for older people's wards. And Jaya, you're here to talk about the AIMS accreditation and winning awards. So over to you, Jaya. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon, all. Happy International Nurses Day. Um, I'm, I'm Jaya Babadas. I'm charging nurse, as Emma introduced. I am working in NHS ILPT. This is my first job from India. This is uh, this is my 16th year, if I remember. So, Asha, thank you for taking me back to memory of India. It, it was a good memory. You've just taken me back, uh, the journey of 16 years, how the international recruitment is. It was really good memory. So I'm here uh, to just talk about the service accreditation, external accreditation, how we have achieved and where we are at at the moment. So Emma, next slide, please. So that the accreditation up to quality network, older adult mental health service, we call QNOMS. So Kirby Ward and Welford Ward Mental Health Service Older Persons and we have um, uh, started in 2018. Next slide, please. What is QNOMS accreditation, which is uh, drawn from 50 authoritative services to ensure the wards have been evaluated against the best practice. So these are three standards. We have type 156 and type 272, and also we have nine type three standards. Next, next one, please. The process, normally the main process of accreditation is we went through self-review, and also we had one, one day accreditation visit by the peer reviewers from other members of Royal College of Psychiatrists. 
and the decision by the accreditation committee on the accreditation status of the service. Please, next one, please. The self review process we have gone through is we as a members we initially basically as a member we have secured some fund by leadership partnership trust. Thank you to our head of service who trusted us um, put the massive trust on us on 2018 thinking of that we will be coming up with accreditation. So we went through a lot of transformation through uh, transformation of the service during the self review process. So for that, we we have to complete the self review. So for to for us to go through the self review, we need to start from somewhere. How can we start that self review for that? We have set up some kind of group called project group. So I just changed it to now as a task and finish group. So we initiated the project group, um, which is a team of MDT, both services, both Kirby Ward and Welford Ward, all the MDTs like um, uh, doctors, uh, AHPs, and also um, nurses and other therapy, technical assistants, dietitians, pharmacists, and everyone we have joined in. So we met uh, every weekly for us to uh, where to start with, how can we meet these standards? So that there was a massive involvement with all staff groups. And also we were sharing the benefits of accreditation to staff and the patients and the carers by working, working along with um, regular staff meeting, discussing with a lot of focus groups, and also we have to uh, meet with every time, um, ensure that we do meet all the staff members across whole service. So it was not easy task for us to meet each and every one of them, where um, which is something a new process, they don't understand what it is. So it was a lot of effort to meet each and every member of the staff to make them understand what is this process, so they could able to um, involved within the process because it's a team effort. So uh, we did the um, uh, we did the self review with the carers self review, and we also done with uh, patients record audit uh, review, and we did the patients review by talking to the patients, and also we had a referrals uh, through other stakeholders, agencies, social service other regulatory bodies and also internal um, internal um, um, I mean colleagues and the professionals who is working with. So there is a lot of involvement for us to do this self review. Next slide, please. So to make it break down of the standards, um, the standards were covering with environment of the ward. So basically, like if you are if you are preparing for internal accreditation or if you are preparing for a CQC, so we will be looking into um, like environment. We'll be looking into the care delivery of the patient, and we also will be looking into the safety of the care. Um, what we are delivering the environment and the risk assessment, the risk management, and also alongside staff well-being, visitors well-being, infection control. So basically covering everything and the standard was more than that. It was heavier than that. So the ward and unit environment was looked into that. Admissions and leave and discharge process were looked into that. The care delivery and, and the treatment for the, our service user we were providing, that was looked into that. And also the staffing, um, um, the skill mix, the qualification and also um, their uh, standards, how we are delivering, and also the 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 review did looked into the service management, the management, the wider perspective, how we are delivering on that for a particular service as a member. The next one, please. So the, you could see the graph of um, how uh, the Welford Ward, the standards have been achieved. And also for Kirby Ward, you can see on the next slide. The expectation from the member. Um, these are the expectation for us to become a, uh, for us to get the accreditation. The next slide, please. The achievements for us to achieve the accreditations uh, before self review for us to submit all these paperwork. We ourselves assessed so we ensure that these are the achievements we have already achieved prior to the accreditation visit so we have set up as a part of service transformation we initiated the carer service carer support group 
So the support group is where it is available for both uh, ward uh, care, both ward patients and also who can be ex patients uh, who left who, who require the support. Those carers will be supported and signposted, and also it was followed up by the ward managers, and also it it was taken back to the uh, matrons and the ward manager, and it was discussed and problem solved during the MDT. So that was the purpose of the carers' support. Um, then that was um, there was a lot of terms and conditions, a lot of uh, standard operating procedures were there to ensure that we are delivering safe and effective group, and they felt comfortable. So the feedback from the carers group was amazing, and which is we are continuing its ongoing. Comprehensive information boards, which is something uh, we have initiated on both wards where how can we ensure we are giving a right information to the regulatory bodies and also within the organizations, patients and carers and the relatives, how can they believe that we are we are delivering the right care on a right time and the first time. So that was important. So we ensure that we are giving the right information is available for staff members and patients and carers and, and everyone. We also initiated the drama therapy sessions. So the drama therapy session was quite challenging for us because it wasn't there anywhere and none of the members were having this drama therapy uh, within the Royal College of Psychiatrists. So um, one of our MDT consultant who really supported us, we brought these ideas within the project group. So we felt, uh, why can't we go with that? Well, let's try. So we have tried that and it was a bit challenging for us to start with because it was um, um, with infection control policies and other policies were um, uh, not collaborating. So we worked hard for us to ensure we could bring this um, project and we want to bring some changes to the service. So we ensure uh, and we brought that changes to the service and it was a success story within the service. And we also implemented well-being clinics. The well-being clinics was really important for us to ensure that the, there is the support available for patients who, are, who was going to be discharged. And we also brought other SOPs, discharge team, and there was a project was taken place that time, medicine administration technicians um, involvement were there. Next slide, please. So on the day of review, we, we, the members were reviewed it and also the monthly review has taken place as a process to maintain the standards. We are redoing the monthly task and finish group and we are also ensuring the standards we are maintaining and we are doing the regular audits which we are incorporated with other audits where we are preparing for CQC and another internal accreditation. And also we, we put the application for the panel member and uh, we are going three weekly round. So where are we at the moment? Next slide, please. Yeah, so the outcome of it and 2018 we have achieved accreditation and you could see um, there are certificates is there and which is uh, it's a massive achievement for the team and it was a proud moment for us and um, personally and it was it's a massive achievement as an individual, as a manager, and also for the colleagues and the service of MSOP and LPT. The next slide, please. And as, a, as an outcome of it, and I'm pleased to say that, and we were, we've been nominated by our uh, director and clinical director and the lead nurse, and as for exceptional care award for 2019, and we were lucky enough to win the award. And also there was a shortlisted candidates that were equally, it was very competing. And I would say for everyone, they, we were all winners, but yes, we were lucky enough to have this award. And thank you for LPT for giving us this award. <laughs> Next one, please. Where are we now in 2021? So currently we are having a um, lot of initiatives continued at the moment. All the initiative we have initiated is ongoing. And the new initiatives I have, uh, we have implemented, especially on Kirby Ward Mental Health Practitioner role, who is a Deputy Ward Manager, it's a success role. Now currently it's going across the LPT, the recruitment is going play, taking place. Physician Associate is already started on Kirby Ward. 
and also we are constantly maintaining the high standards and um, um, the panel member is becoming the committee member she is um, the member of the person on one of our service who is sitting in the panel for external accreditation across the country we are doing a peer review nationally and uh, we have already done a lot of peer review as external accreditators and um, that is one of the massive achievement we are doing face to face we are doing virtual and we are doing a case formulations two weekly to ensure that staff well-being psychological safety inclusion inclusive leadership is available collaborative care planning is trust wide is going going taking place that supporting us and also there is a lot of quality improvement project we have uh, registered in a life qi one of the quality improvement project is storytelling by the member uh, employee who is having a lived experience and i think that's the last slide yeah this is a hope tree on kirby board we just brought it it's a patient's voice they felt this is what they wanted it's like a family and friends test they're putting that experience what they wanted created by the patients using the chime and recovery model that's it and thank you oh wow Thank you, Jaya. Thank you very much. What what an incredible journey and story to share and, and showing all over that time and, and what's happening now. And I know, Jaya, we worked together, didn't we, when we introduced medicines administration technicians and we did some action learning. So it's really, really lovely to see you today. It so is. Thanks. We are still doing that at the moment. So yes, you are leaving us. You left us. So I am continuing that for Across the Trust. So yeah. we have started the action learning. So yeah, it's ongoing just to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Fantastic. We've got a few minutes, so I'd just like to open it up um, before I summarise. I've been capturing some thoughts. So has anybody got any questions for our panel of speakers today? Oh, I can see a hand, but I can't see. Yeah. It's me, Emma. It's Margot. Oh, hi, Margot. Hello. Sorry. Hi, that's all right. Jo, I just wanted to ask you about the next accreditation. So when will you go through the process again? Will you re-accredit? Accredit? Is there a plan for that? Yeah, uh, mine will be, Kirby Ward will be going through in July. So July, I'm sure it's the third week of July. And uh, Wellford will be going in August. Brilliant. Thank you. Good luck with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, Margot. Any other questions? Have we blown everybody away? <laughs> well, thank I've got I've got some words to capture um, and, and hopefully I've captured comments as well. I've had some words for me. I've got pride, great professional pride. I'm going to apologise in advance now if I get emotional. I can't help it. I'm very passionate about nursing and, and, and the value of nursing, as you know, and, and I had a bit of a cry on Monday, so I'm going to apologise in advance. Pride, um, going above and beyond, adaptable, tenacity, achievement, fabulous, resourceful, co-designing, award-winning, valuing others, inspirational, hope, gratitude, achievement, celebration. So th thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of the speakers today. Thank you for taking time out to attend and celebrate with us. Happy International Nurses Day. I hope you have a fantastic day and really enjoy reflecting and celebrating your wonderful selves. So before I make an absolute mess of myself and start really crying, have, have an amazing day and, and thank you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So thanks for sharing. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you. you.